Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar Imhotep with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And today is Friday, May the 20th, 2022. And today is a workshop titled A Crash Crash Course in Historical Comparative Linguistics. We're going to learn some fundamentals on how historical comparative linguistics is done. And this will be an opportunity to introduce you all to the comparative method. All that and more will return in just a second. excuse i'm out and about again um my my work has me in far off places so i have to find spots to uh get on the net so you know excuse any uh background noise that you hear and just want to you know remind you all that today is a workshop uh titled a crash crash course in historical comparative linguistics um, but before we get into that, I just want to, you know, announce uh, a few interviews that we got coming up next week. And so starting off the conversation is our good brother, uh, Kevin MC Chill Heard. Uh, he's going to start off our uh, Cleveland All-Stars Week. So we're interviewing some movers and shakers out of Cleveland, Ohio, uh, some people who I've known and met uh, recently coming from Detroit. And we're going to have a Detroit week uh, as well. So some of the individuals who I met in Detroit for the Power and Unity Conference, uh, the One Africa Power and Unity Conference uh, will be, you know, in the building. That's going to be in June. So we're going to start off with Cleveland and starting off is going to be our good brother, Kevin M.C. Chill Heard, who's a journalist and M.C., uh, hip hop head and one who was about that knowledge and spreading uh, the information. He's also a radio host and a, and a plethora of other things. So y'all uh, be on the lookout for that. That's going to be on this coming Sunday, the 22nd, I believe is the date. Yeah, the 22nd is the date. And then on Tuesday, which is the 24th, Oh, and this is going to be on uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, on Sunday. And so on Tuesday at 1 p.m., uh, we're going to be interviewing Vince Robinson, who is also a radio host, as well as uh, a screenwriter and uh, a pianist. Um, he, he owns a facility or co-owns a facility out in Ohio where they do all kinds of, you know, art shows um you know concerts and the like and he's doing some big things so we'll talk to him on tuesday and then on thursday we have our good sister ladosha wright who is a uh, hairstylist beautician uh, as well as an author and we can now add documentarian to the mix and we're going to talk about her upcoming documentary film on hair and you know just her journey and she also has products so we're going to be talking about some of her products i have some of them and have used them and so uh you know she's just an all-around talent and an underground hip-hop head as well so we're going to talk about some of that hip-hop history and her connections with our good brother kevin mc chill and so you know uh, be on the lookout for that that's going to be at 8 p.m and for those of you who are on patreon 
uh, we will be interviewing our good brother out of South Africa, our Unc Kim Sama, uh, who's a uh, natural, you know, a healer, uh, a metaphysician, and one who also teaches about, you know, African history uh, and Egyptology and the like, all the way down there in South Africa. And so, you know, this interview will be happening live for the people on the Patreon. So if you want to get in on Patreon, I advise everyone to visit patreon.com forward slash Assault M Hotel. And when you join, you get, you know, access to exclusive interviews uh, and, and content and the like that that others don't have, or you will get them early in which we will release at some time later in the future. And your support also helps with the documentary film Chin Into, uh, which will, you know, be shooting. Uh, well, the, the beginnings will be uh, the, the first interviews will be shot this summer for the proof of concept trailer. And so um, you can support in that way, or you can also go to our website chin into film.com and you know you can make a donation so we're almost close to our five thousand dollar goal uh, and you know it is it in its own and popping from there so we'd like to uh thank each and every one of you who have uh, made yourselves known in the comment section so uh peace and blessings to Teti Ursa Ma'at Ross and Neferu. Sister Tamika is in the building. And Monica Lamb. And I still want to call you Monica. You're still Monica uh, to me. But I know that's not your name. And so, you know, black folks have a habit of not calling people by their name. But, you know, uh, charge it to my heart and not my head. And we got Emmanuel Adama is in the building. Keenan Wright is in the building. Amar Berry is in the building. And Sister Regina Wilson is in the building. And I'm going to come back to this comment in just a second. Peace and blessings to Sister Emmy Kett, who's also in the building. Marlon and Any Herod Calfani is also in the building. So uh, let me go back to uh, Sister Wilson's comments. Says, Greetings to Sarm Hotep. I am on a reparations uh, colloquium tonight with Mr. William Darity and Miss Kristen Mullen. It lasts until nine. Have you done uh, such a program on reparations? I don't believe so. At least not recently. Maybe about nine or ten years ago. But nothing updated. And if, if you would like to leave that charge and you have some people who you think I should should talk to on that question, uh, holler at me and then we'll put it together. And so uh, let me see how to spell that. Please know the Patreon is. Uh, here we go. Patreon dot com forward slash Asar M. Hotep. And I think we only need about around 500. I think we're about 500 shy in, in terms of our goal. And so we, we out of the 5,000, you know, we, we raised about 4,500 uh, with all the love and support, you know, from our viewers. Ooh, just pressing buttons here, and here we go. And so, yes, this is the, oops. This is the link uh, for the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Asar M Hotep. And let me see, Mr. Untouchable is in the building. And Fire Light and Tist is in the building. So I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for coming in and joining the conversation. And Sister Wilson says, from here to equality is their book. All right, yes. Uh, I'm going to have to take a, a, a look at that, and I, and I appreciate the uh, you shouting them out and and making me know uh, of them. And so I will uh, definitely revisit this and and see what we can do about having them on the show if they would like. And I think that is it. And so we are streaming right now on on Twitter, of course, on YouTube. 
and on Facebook. So uh, if you're on Twitter, of course, I won't be able to see any comments that you've made. But, you know, uh, I can come back and visit every now and then just to double check and, and make sure that everything is good. <laughs> and so, uh, and Sister Wilson said that she'll be back in about an hour. And so, of course, handle your business. Uh, thank you for, for coming, you know, regardless and, and, and making your presence known. Your, your presence is always uh, good here. Uh, and, and the love is felt. So uh, you enjoy your time there. All righty. So back to the, the topic at hand. Uh, we are going to do this as a workshop. And so, you know, normally the first 15 minutes, I just try to make announcements and things. So let some folks come in if we're doing a live. And so I'm going to just start a little bit earlier today because I don't have that many announcements. And I want to get started on um, on this topic and so the reason for the workshop is that you know uh, be because of the the depth and the the ongoing issues and conversations regarding the etymology of the word Kemet debate there have been many who are unfamiliar with some of the tools that we use in in Africology to to answer certain questions, and so I am taking this opportunity to kind of introduce the laypersons to uh, historical comparative linguistics and the comparative method. Now, note that you know historical comparative linguistics is a a subfield of linguistics in general. And there is so much more involved in the process. So what I'm going to show you tonight only begins to scratch the surface. And so, but I, I wanna help you all to better understand at least my work and, and how I'm using it to, to answer these questions of history. So if you got the notice for this particular program today, you know that uh, in the description, there was a link to a, a document that I was hope you would be able to read beforehand. So the presentation that I am going to do today is not my own presentation. It is the presentation of the professor, Dr. Weiss, who wrote the chapter that I shared with you all in the link. So it's, it's, it's a more condensed uh, version of that chapter. And I want to uh, inform you all as well that I added a second link that is even a more uh, concise and, and, and summary of what we're going to do today. So you know, the, the first link is going to be the full chapter with, you know, the full paragraphs or the like. The second link is, is fundamentally the same, in, the same information, but it's just broken down into just sentences and it is, it is real easy to follow, right? So, you know, both of those links are in the description and you can download them. You know, this is a course I took from UCLA way back in the day. Um, so, uh, peace and blessings to Omar Reed in the building and Gary Hart and Obaya Man and Ifa Tunde Fayemi and Sister Ladosha Wright, who I mentioned earlier, will be on the show on Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. So, make sure y'all check it out. Thank you all for joining the Mbongi. And before we get started, I just want to make sure that each and every one of you do the following.
that is right make sure that you hit the likes and if you are new to the program or to this channel make sure that you uh, hit the bell and subscribe uh, so that you can get the notices when we have you know uh, these these dynamic interviews or uh, any of the programs you know workshops like we have here today so i'm just going to get started and i'm going to stop my uh, camera for a moment and i'm going to share my screen and so we're going to do full screen today let's just do that and get started so um let me just start from the beginning so as i stated before you all in the in the section in the um the description of the the video um, you will see two links and so the first link is going to be to this document right here and it is the comparative method um, which is to appear in the rootledge handbook of historical linguistics edited by claire boren and um, bethwin evans if i'm saying that correctly correctly uh in 2014 and so you can see it is a little bit more you know paragraph oriented you can see the examples that we'll get into today but we won't be reading all of this and then the second document is this one right here so it's the same it's the same author but as you can see it is not so paragraphy it is just bullet points all the way through so this you know if if you don't have the uh you know the time to really just read all of that which i suggest you do um i would you know have i would go through this first and then you can get all the the other details by just going uh to the other document all righty so those are the two documents that um uh, that that you have so uh, comparative method of linguistic reconstruction the kind of summary bullet port form and then the uh the the full chapter you know on the subject and so let's edit that here so here's the presentation form and so what i'm going to do is make it let's go to view full screen so let me see here let me see um let me all righty so i pulled out my phone and i have the chat open uh, the youtube chat that is if you are commenting on facebook normally that chat will come in but i'm not in the in the main program to see those so i can only at this moment see the chat that is on youtube right so uh, we can get started so i'm just gonna read so uh, everything looks good uh, okay and thank you uh to brother any harry calfani for posting the links in the chat all right all right so as i mentioned before one of the major tools that we use when trying to reconstruct history is historical comparative linguistics and one of the methodologies used or the primary methodology used in historical comparative linguistics is what we call the comparative method so this is an introduction to the comparative method and i should say that uh you know if you want to want to look at this from the african languages perspective go into our archives and look up the videos and the interviews that we've done with uh, brother jean-claude and Boli. and so we did a similar workshop on a comparative method with Jean-Claude and Boli. So uh, look look at that in the archives, all right? So I'm just gonna read here. So the comparative method is the most important of the various methods and techniques we use to recover linguistic history and language. 
In this section, we will talk about the comparative method, its basic assumptions, and its limitations. The primary emphasis will be to understand how to apply the method. In other words, how to reconstruct a linguistic item. This method is also important for language classification for research on distant genetic relationships between languages and for other areas. So the, the comparative method is used for a variety of reasons, you know, um, but primarily we, we're, we're looking to see about relationships between languages and if we have enough evidence to reconstruct the, the parent language, right? And so we say that languages which belong to the same language family are genetically related to one another. Now, keep in mind that this genetically related is, is more so a metaphor. And so we're not talking about biological relationships here. But, you know, a, a biological relationship is something that is, you know, kind of scientifically established and, and, and very strong. Uh, when, when we're talking about these types of relationships. And so we like to use that as a metaphor in historical comparative linguistics and even a, and even the notion of like a, a parent language and a daughter or sister language showing, you know, using, you know, kinship terms to, to, uh, to argue for the relationship between, you know, data sets you know, rep representing languages, right? Now, <laughs> this means that these related languages are derived from a single original language called a proto-language. And so in course of time, various dialects from the proto-language developed through linguistic changes in different regions where there is spoken. So the assumption in linguistics is that there was a proto-language, there was a mother language, right? And the people who spoke that language, their children and their children's children began to move apart and settle further and further away from each other. And when they move apart from each other and, you know, new generations over time develop and they go further and further out for whatever reason, dialects form of the parent language that their that their ancestors spoke and given enough time and enough distance if they haven't really interacted with each other in a in a long time then over time it will be hard for these now separated groups who are all related uh, to the ancestral, the ancestors who spoke the ancestral language and form, it is it's going to be hard for them to understand each other. And when it gets to that point where dialects are no longer understood by, you know, the related groups, we then argue that new languages have formed. So in this discussion, we're going to use the Latin language as an example and the latin language has you know over time that was the language of the empire of rome and that language split off into several different languages into portuguese into spanish into french for example right and so when we do the analysis on these languages in comparison to the mother language which was latin you know, this is one of the ways in which we can test the, the historical comparative method, because if our method is correct, then this is one of those rare examples where we have in written form the mother language and then we have the daughter languages still in existence. So Latin is, Latin is no longer spoken as a first language for, you know, many people. It's, it's a liturgical language for the Roman Catholic Church. Right. In the same way that Coptic is, no one speaks Coptic, but Coptic, the language is a liturgical language used to read, you know, religious texts uh, of the Coptic church. And so it's the same thing with Latin. And, and so this is, you know, a good test for the method. 
right? And then we we go there, you know, we go beyond, you know, languages that are written, you know, the languages that are unwritten using the same method. And that's another conversation for another time. And more importantly, that that is what you what we discuss in the conversation with Jean Claude and Boley. And so I see that uh, Sister Emmy Kett has posted those uh, conversations, the links to those conversations in the chat. And so uh, thank you, Sister Emmy Kett, for that. Right. So let's continue. Moreover, be it language or dialect, it keeps constantly changing. And then later through future changes, the dialects become distinct languages, as I just said. The aim of reconstruction by the comparative method is to recover the ancestor language, the proto-language, by doing a comparison of the descendant languages. We also try to determine what changes have taken place in the various languages that have developed from the proto-language. The work of reconstruction usually begins with phonology. That means the sounds of the language with an attempt to reconstruct the sound system. This leads in turn to reconstruction of the vocabulary and then to the grammar of the proto-language. So we reconstruct the, the phonemes on the sounds of the language, we reconstruct the vocabulary, and then we reconstruct the morphemes or the grammar of the language. Those are the three major things that we are looking for in, in terms of the reconstruction process of, you know, the you by, you know, through the process of the comparative method, right? And so I want to kind of before I go back there go to to this image here right so you know I use this image in the you know one Africa power and unity conference but this is a plane right uh, an airplane that crashed somewhere in the world at some time in history I don't have that details it's just a image that I got from, you know, a good Google search, right? So, but you can see that, you know, what they do is they collect the surviving, you know, parts of the plane that crashed. And because we have an idea of what, you know, planes and things look like, you know, we, we kind of know what parts go together, right? So what the what the engineers and everyone does is they take those broken pieces that are collected of the plane crash, and then they try to piece it back together so that they can see, okay, well, what area of the plane, you know, crashed first or what was the possible cause, you know, in the, the plane or was there a design flaw you know, there was something that they didn't anticipate or whatnot. So they're, they're able to tell a lot by, by reconstructing the plane. But as you can see from the image here, they don't have all the parts to the plane. So it's impossible for them to reconstruct the, you know, the plane as new from the wreckage that was left that survived that they were able to get those parts and get, right? So it's the same thing in historical comparative linguistics. You know, we're looking at living languages that we have access to. Languages are born and die all the time. So there are some languages that we don't even know we lost that may have had valuable information that we just no longer have access to, right? And and then because languages are, are dynamic, they're living, they're constantly changing. And because of borrowing from other languages, and then of course, the, the language death or dialect deaths and things of that nature, it is impossible to recover, you know, every aspect of the, the, the surviving elements of the parent language. So we take the survivals that we can find in each of the daughter languages and we use that information to reconstruct the parent language. So I'm hoping this makes sense. So I'm hoping this analogy that, that y'all can see, uh, you know, through the plain wreckage analogy, exactly what we mean by the reconstructing process 
So, you know, we're we're attempting to reconstruct the plane and, and to get answers of, of how it used to be. And then, you know, what was the process for which it differentiated? And and we only have the pieces, you know, for today. So let me go back here, back to uh, the full screen. Right. So we also try to determine what changes have taken place in the various languages that develop from the proto languages. We just mentioned that the work of reconstruction usually begins with the phonology. And I just read that part. So as we know, and can also be seen from the way languages are classified, we speak of linguistic relationships in terms of kinship. I mentioned that just a while ago, right? So we talk about sister languages, daughter languages, parent language, and language families. These are all, you know, used in a kind of metaphoric sense, you know, uh, you know, talking about kinship. But, you know, we, we should not confuse. Uh, we should not confuse linguistic relationship with biological genetic relationship. There is no correlation at all. Whole groups of people can adopt, you know, or be forced to adopt a new language. And they can do that without, you know, any or a large scale, you know, uh, genetic flow between groups. So, you know, you should always keep linguistic relationships and genetic relationships separate. There's no correlation there. All right. <laughs> In terms of the relationship aspect. So let's continue. <laughs> if reconstruction is successful, it shows that the assumption that the languages are related is justified. Let me stop here. So the, we, we mentioned the comparative method and what it is, and, and we'll, we'll more formally define it in just a little bit. But the comparative method is used to, to justify a hypothesis. I prefer to say the falsify hypothesis. So let's, let's just say that we have an hypothesis that language A is related to language B, right? So we, we go through the historical comparative method and we come to find out that that is in fact true, right? So the comparative method is the methodology used to, to um, justify the, the hypothesis that language A is in fact related to language B. Now that, that you know, we should, we should use this in a sense, we should view this in a sense like we do in science. Because in science, we, we don't try to justify hypotheses. In reality, we try to falsify them. Because in science, you can't prove anything. Proof is the domain of mathematics and logic. In science, we, it's, it's, it's a statistical thing. And so we do a number of experiments so that we can have statistical data to see that, you know, we, we, we weigh the evidence and to see if we were to do this experiment just one more time, what is the probability that we're going to get the same results that we just did, you know, in this series of experiments, right? So in, in the same sense, we, we do that even in linguistics because you, you can't really prove that two languages are really unrelated. But you can, you know, make a probabilistic argument and, and show that, you know, if they are related, that there's there's little significant evidence to justify the argument. Right. And so, you know, th this is a little bit beyond what I'm trying to get into, but I just want to mention this, you know, for those of you who are uh, uh, listening. Right. Okay, so let's go. By comparing what these sister languages inherited from their ancestor, and it's in the same way, like, you know, you you have, you know, genes from both your parents. You, you get your eye color, your hair color, your your height, your, your skin tone, et cetera, et cetera. Even some markers for disease, et cetera, from your parents. So in linguistics, these genetic traits are the phonology, 
the the vocabulary, the basic vocabulary, the morphology, you know, the process in which you conjugate your verbs, et cetera. You know, these these are the things that are inherited into the daughter languages. And so, you know, that metaphor, we, we try to keep the metaphor up as 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 much as possible. All right. So by comparing what these sister languages inherited from their ancestor, we attempt to reconstruct the linguistic traits which Proto-Romance languages possess. Remember that I said that the uh, the the focus of this author who, who produced this is the, the Latin, or we should say the Romance languages, right? And that's Latin who gave birth to the, the French, Portuguese, and uh, Spanish languages, right? So that's 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 going to be the examples that we see here. So, if we are successful, what we reconstruct for Proto-Romance by the comparative method should be similar to the Proto-Romance, which was actually spoken at the time before it split up into its daughter languages. Of course, our success is dependent upon the extent to which evidence of the original traits is preserved in the descendant languages which we compare. The success is dependent upon how accurate and careful we are at applying the techniques of the comparative method. And so moreover, Latin is abundantly documented and hence we can check to see whether what we reconstruct by the comparative method has some approximation to written sources. However, the procedure of checking our reconstructions in this way is not possible for most language families as we have no written records from many proto-families. Then he goes on to, you know, give the example of Proto-Germanic, uh, for which English we don't have, you know, that uh, we don't have written records, you know, of their beginning. So we can't prove, uh, excuse me, we can't weigh our reconstructions against, you know, the Proto-Germanic written forms. And Proto-Germanic is not the same as the, the, uh, the German language. You know, Proto-Germanic is the name given to the ancestor language that gave birth to Dutch, English, you know, uh, German, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I'm going to skip down. At the present time, existing languages which have relatives all have a history which classifies them into language families. By applying the comparative method to related languages, we can postulate what that common earlier ancestor was like and we can reconstruct that language, right? So thus comparing English with its relatives, Dutch, Frisian, German, Danish, Swedish, Icelandic, and so on, we attempt to understand what the proto-language in this case called proto-Germanic was like. So proto-Germanic is a, a linguistic name. It is not the, we don't know what the proto-German uh, people actually call themselves or or what they call their language it's just a linguistic term and so this this is the name that linguists uh, who study indo-european languages have given the uh the proto-germanic speakers mm -hmm. right so we continue thus in effect uh english is a much changed dialect of proto-germanic having undergone successive linguistic changes to make it what it is today. It has changed to a different language from Swedish and German and its other sisters, which underwent different changes of their own. So what, what we wanna kind of drill in your head is that languages change, sounds are replaced, even vocabulary are replaced over time. So although sounds change and you know words merge and split and et cetera, when we systematically compare them, we're we're able to see the pattern of the relationships between the languages, because we're going to see in in just a little bit what we mean by sound meaning correspondences, and and how no matter what it looks like on the surface, when we when we look at it carefully and systematically, you can see those patterns and and that deep. Uh, knowledge, excuse me, those, uh, the deep relationship, the deep kinship between these languages. And this is going to be very important. And so keep in mind that we're doing all of this so that we can help the layperson understand the nature of the methods 
used when arguing for the place name Kimmy. So there's there's a lot that you're going to have to kind of uh, learn and understand. And we're just trying to, you know, help you with that process. So we're not going to talk about Kemet tonight, but, you know, I just want to give you all resources and give you an idea of what we do when we are professionally, you know, researching and seeking information about history through language. Right. So therefore, every proto language was once a real language, regardless of whether we are successful at reconstructing it or not. Looks like we have come back to where we started from. So, in short, the comparative method is a way to examine the ways that help to find out languages that have been derived from the proto-language. And having sprung from the proto-language, how have they come to develop into a fully-fledged language by adopting the changes that have come on the way? And so, in many respects, the, the comparative method is almost like if you were to do a sketch from, a, you know, an eyewitness testimony and, you know, how the police have the, the sketch artists and, you know, based upon, you know, how you describe it, the, the sketch artist is able to put together a composite image you know, uh, the reconstruction process is similar to that. Now, we're basically trying to put together a, a composite image of the suspect, right? The suspect being the proto-language in this analogy. And, you know, we're trying to see, you know, how close we can draw the, the profile of the suspect based upon the witness testimony. So what what, how we're able to, or how detailed and how close we are to the inaccurate, you know, drawing of the, the potential suspect or whatnot depends on the quality of the testimony that the witness gives, right? So we don't expect it to be 100% accurate, uh, which is why we don't, you know, rely on reconstructions when we're doing our comparative work. But that's another conversation for another day. However, you know, it gives us a model by which to to make inferences concerning, again, history and even the psychology and culture of a people. But that's another conversation, again, for another day. So let's continue. Uh, so in order to make a better sense of the comparative method, and to see how they are applied, we need to, that's supposed to be brush up, brush up some of the concepts and technical terms. So now we're going to define those terms that we've been using, right? So when we talk about a proto-language, we're talking about the language that was once spoken from which the daughter language is descended. So we're talking about great-great-grandmother. And so, you know, when we look at you know, our current brothers and sisters, you know, we're, we're trying to see what features that we have that that great, great, great grandmama had. Right. So the language reconstructed by the comparative method, which represents the ancestral language from which the compared language is descended. So the proto language is the language that the daughter languages, the, the surviving languages that we are able to examine today descended from. So what is a sister language? A sister language or sister language or languages which are related to one another by virtue of having descended from the same common ancestor, therefore the proto-language, are sisters. That is, languages which belong to the same family are sisters to one another. Now, we really don't use brother and, you know, or father. We don't use the, the male uh, uh you know, genitive for for our analogies in terms of kinship. So it's always going to be the mother tongue or, you know, the daughter languages. And and then, of course, if they're daughters, the, the, the surviving languages are sisters to one another. Right. So we, we keep everything consistent. All right. So the cognate. So y'all have heard me talk about cognates before. But, you know, unless you have my, you know, work, especially Illusion Volume 2, you know, you may not have had a formal definition. So here's a formal definition. 
of what a cognate is, right? So a cognate is a word or a morpheme. And a morpheme is simply, you know, those added bits of sound that are used to, you know, extend the meaning or to provide tense, you know, like future tense, past tense, you know, on verbs, for example. So, you know, if we have the word walk, walk is a, is a, a word itself, right? And then we had walked. So walked is past tense. The morphine on walked is the added ED, right? Then we have walking. So this is a present tense. So ing is, is another morphine that you can add to the root walk, right? And then in the, in the same context as you could say walks, so you can add an S. So, you know, Ron walks, you know, often to the store. It could be, uh, you know, that could be almost a past tense as well. That could be used as a past tense. So, you know, these are morphemes. So if I, if I say, you know, uh, you know, don't prejudge, you know, the pre is a morpheme, right? Which means before, you know, um, if I say anachronistic, right? The A before the A is a morpheme, which, which means kind of like a negative or the opposite, you know, from the root chronos, you know, anachronistic and the, and the, the mystic or uh, the stick part is also a morphine right so you know knowing these different parts of speech you know will help you to to better understand uh that in the, the reconstruction process we also reconstruct those those grammatical elements as well so a cognate is a word or morphine which is related to a word or morphine in sister languages by reason of these forms having been inherited by these sister languages from a common word or morphine of the proto language from which the sister languages have descended right so by way of the comparative method we're able to establish that this morphine matches this morpheme is logically equivalent to this morpheme in language two from language one right and that this you know basic vocabulary word is the same as this vocabulary word in language two again from language one right <laughs> so and then we have a cognate set so the set of words or morphemes which are related to one another across the sister languages because they are inherited and have descended from a single word or morpheme of the proto language right so we have you know a cognate in the singular and then we have a cognate set and so the the we have a set of data so for example let me let me go so this is my so like if, if we look at you know what i have here all right so i'm i'm arguing here that the proto bantu reconstructions are logically equivalent to the Egyptian uh, forms that we see here in terms of these words, right? We have a series here, we have our minimum three, and then we can see that that there's a, uh, a correspondence between a B in the initial position in Proto-Bantu with the B in the Egyptian in the initial position and the D in the second consonant position in Proto-Bantu with the N as in Nancy in Egyptian in a second consonant position. So when we see this series, we know that this is cognate with this, and this is cognate with this based on the sound laws that we've established. So this is the sound law right here. So proto Bantu BD uh, consonant sequence implies Middle Egyptian BN. So this is what we're saying. So this is a set. This is a, so, so the proto Bantu Bedi, breast teat, is a cognate of Egyptian benti, nipples, and breast. And this is a morpheme that doubles the uh, the root here, uh, or implies there's a double of the root here, right? But these, so these two are cognates. They're, this is a cognate. But together, since we have a series here, 
this is a cognate set. So it's it's a it's tables and rows full of related words that we can uh, establish based on the sound meaning correspondences between the two. So this is a cognate set. So this is the formal term of, of this table here, right? So let's go back. And here we go. So sound correspondence, therefore a correspondence set. This is a set of cognate sounds, the sounds found in the related words of cognate sets, which correspond from one related language to others because they have descended from a common ancestral sound. A sound correspondence is assumed to reoccur or recur in various cognate sets, right? So let's go back. Let's go back to our example. All right, so here we go. So as you can see here, that we have our, our individual cognates here, but this is the entire cognate set. But this is also, these are the correspondences. So when you see in my tables, when, when I do my work, uh, you, you see that I have all my tables like this. I have, you know, language A and language B or language C. And I have a, a table here of correspondences. And these are the sound correspondences. So, so uh, as I mentioned here, the Bs of Proto-Bantu correspond to the Bs in Egyptian. And they're supposed to be representative of each row, excuse me, each column. So B, the this first B is for column one, and the second B is for column two. And as we can see here, the D corresponds to N and is regular. This is a series that we can that we can demonstrate here so so this is a correspondent set sound correspondence so if if you uh if you understand this you know you know you'll be able to uh move forward so let's go uh, right and so a reflex is a term used for the descendant in a daughter language for a sound of the proto language that is said to be a reflex of the original sound. So I don't have an example here of a reflex, but we will in a little bit. All right. Uh, from in, in terms of my presentation there. And so meaning that the original sound of the proto language is said to be reflected by the sound which descends from it in a daughter language. In another simple way, it is a speech element derived from a corresponding form in an earlier state of the language. For example, sorrow is a reflex of Middle English sore. So we say sorrow today, but earlier they used to say sore. And so we can see that the E has been dropped and that the there was an additional uh, uh, R you know, added as well as, you know, the, uh, the insertion of another O, you know, or we can say that there was a metathesis on the E and the W at the end here and that the E became O in the environment preceding the W. But, you know, I would have to see other examples to know if that was the case, but, you know, you should be able to understand so this is the earlier form of of sorrow in middle english but now we say it like this today so sorrow the modern form is a reflex of the earlier form so that's what we mean by a reflex so for ease of description we will talk about steps in the application of the comparative method these steps are not said to be applied in a uniform way in every case however these steps are important to understand the concept of the comparative method. So when, when we do the comparative method, this is the steps involved in the comparative method, right? So as I stated earlier, you know, there's, there's a lot more to the, uh, 
historical comparative linguistics and the comparative method then we are able to cover here today but at least you know what the process is so the first step is to assemble cognates the second step is to establish the sound correspondences the third step is to reconstruct the proto sound and then within that process you have directionality majority wins factoring in features held in common and economy and this is where our our presentation stops for today but there are other steps in this process so then step four we have to determine the status of similar correspondence sets check the plausibility of the reconstructed sound from the perspective of the overall phonological inventory of the proto language check the plausibility of the reconstructed sound from the perspective of linguistic universals and typological expectations and lastly reconstruct individual morphemes right so as you can see there are seven basic steps in this process so it is very involved it is very time consuming and it is very tedious right and so it is boring as hell but exciting at the same time for those who are in it and so when 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 we say that you know certain work hasn't been done this is what we mean these seven steps have not been done in the process and so you know don't think that you're just gonna just just read something online and understand what the comparative method and its processes are you know it is it is very involved and you know it is not for the weak it is not for the weary it is not for those who like to do shortcuts it is not for those who who are comfortable in their mediocrity it, it is it is it is very much an intense uh, process, which, you know, you need a lot of resources to achieve. And it is something that you definitely cannot microwave. So when somebody starts talking about explaining the, the comparative method and certain processes and they want it in 120 characters or less, laugh at them and walk off. Well, don't laugh at them, but still walk off because they're not serious. Uh, but let's continue. So the 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 author here now goes with each of the steps. So I'm not going to go through the entire tire thing here uh, tonight. I'm going to break this up. I was initially going to go three hours strong, but I'm just going to break this up into different uh, sections. So we're just going to do the first one today. That is the assemble the cognates right so you you have the steps and i have these steps all outlined in alluja volume two and from the same source uh, which is cited and so you know for those of you who have that text and you want to kind of go over it a little bit you know it, it is there in volume two and the second half of the book where i'm getting ready to have the conversation about you know the debate that dr wesley muhammad and i are are having in regards to Allah and Ra, etc. So let's get it in. So he says, let us briefly examine these steps. For more details, read Kemp. All righty. So in order to begin to apply the comparative method, we look for potential cognates among related languages and list them in some orderly manner or form in rows or columns like we saw in the previous uh, slide or the, the, the previous presentation of slides. Let us see the table given in the next slide for cognates, right? So, <clears throat> well, I forgot Italian in that list as well. So, so the so this is a cognate set, you know, that was put together by the author. And so what we have here, we're comparing essentially four daughter languages. So we have Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, 
and French. And these are the daughter languages of Latin. And together, all five of these languages and more comprise what we call the Romance languages. So remember that Latin was the language of Rome, thus Romance languages of the Empire of Rome. And so that language differentiated into these four dialects that we call Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. And the French dialect is, is a, a perfect example of why you cannot, um, you know, link genetics and linguistics because the French, the original French speakers were a bunch of Germanic speakers who came and settled in the area and adopted, they abandoned their language and adopted the Latin language. And that through a dialectical process is what became French. So you have a different genetic biological group, still Europeans, who adopted another European and uh, a more distantly related language, and it formed its own, you know, language. It's kind of it's kind of the same way with Hebrew. So you have a, a group of outsiders who spoke some language, who came into Canaan and adopted the Canaanite language, and that Canaanite language is what. Uh, which differentiated over time in terms of a dialect, and it is now what we call Hebrew. But Hebrew is just the the Canaanite language, and just the way that French is just the Latin language that has differentiated itself, you know, over time, right? But the original French speakers were Germanic language speakers, and so that's just a little bit of history that you know um, maybe useful to you all in the future. All right, so we have the four main languages that we're comparing, and we only have the Latin here just to show, to see if, you know, how it differs from the parent language. So this is the, the rare instance where we have the parent language that was also written, and that we can compare our reconstructions to the, to the parent language, right? And so, and then we have the English gloss on the, on the, on the far right. All right, so let's let's go through a couple of these. Let's go to the first three uh, by itself. So we have the word in Italian capra, in Spanish cabra, in Portuguese cabra, in French chevron, and then in the original Latin it was capra, meaning a goat. But notice how in the first row, we have the word spelled with a C, but in the, uh, the row below it, you see it spelled with a K in the initial uh, consonant position. Because ideally, we want to compare the actual sounds. So we know that the C, for example, can have the S sound and the K, K sound, right? So we don't want to we don't want to confuse it. So it's not sapra, a sabra, it's capra, right? So this is why we have it, and we usually put it in these uh, these dialect these uh, diagonal dashes, right? These kind of in the forty five. I don't know what angle that is. Uh, but you know, in these brackets here, this is where you see uh, the the actual pronunciation. So let's go over here to the to the French in the top row. So you see how it has ch, right? But in this one, we have this symbol here that represents the sh sound, right? And this e is not the regular e; it's e. And so this is the IPA. International Phonetic Association, you know, symbol that we use for it. So I'm not sure because this is kind of blurry, even even on my screen. So, you know, hopefully y'all can see it. And I know in the other in the two documents that I give you, it's a lot clearer. So you can you can reference that as well, right? <laughs> and let me see. 
so so we can see how these forms here have have changed from the latin and the only the italian seems to have the uh the original form that you find in the latin language in the latin script right so let's go to the second row this is caro a caro or caro caro and but in the portuguese we notice that it's pronounced caru even though it's it's spelled with an o so this is why you know knowing the language and knowing the sounds the phonetics of the language uh you know is very important in this process because you know even though y'all see me when i'm doing comparisons with ancient egyptian i'm mainly dealing with the consonants but that's because the egyptian language did not write out their vowels but in most other languages you would be very much concerned with the with the vowels as well right and so we, we not only compare the consonants we compare the vowels to see how the vowels have changed you know over time so this karu deer but notice that same what was ka, uh, k sound in this one you know bef before this front vowel becomes palatalized so it becomes sh right and so we have in the third row, capo, and then we have cabo, and then we have cabu, right? So we have the, there's a correspondence here, and the final O is pronounced U in Portuguese. And then we have she, right? And which means, and, but in Latin, it was fully caput. And we know that this is an African word because this final T is actually a suffix of body parts that was inherited in indo-european that's another conversation for another time but it means head or top so when you call somebody a a chief or you know even when you use the word chef like you know it's just a word it's a literal word for head right or or top so this is the same so we can see in these reflexes the uh the the different derived meanings like main chief so when you say chief you're calling somebody the head literally the top person the head or the extremity right so we have i see we have chefron in the the chat somewhere and you know uh you can you can see you know that the chef i don't know if if chefron if if, if he has the word uh chef or chief in it but you know it, it's kind of spelled uh, i'm saying it because it's pronounced in a similar way right so you can you can see the sound changes in each one of these words so we can see that in the second consonant position let's go all the way back to the top where italian has p spanish has b portuguese has b and french has v as in vicky right but the original form was p so we would reconstruct P, but, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll just wait for that, right? And then we have, for example, like all the R's seem to be the same in all the languages. So R did not change, right? But we can see here in the original Latin, the first vowel is ah. Or a right and it, it may it remained consistent in all in italian spanish and portuguese but when it came to french it became an e you know we would say it's e right and so some form of front vowel to e so we we can see the sound change from a to e in french and it's consistent so you notice how it's consistent like when we see the P here in in the first row, and when we go to number three, we see the P in Italian. So P P in Italian is consistent, and Spanish is B B, Portuguese B B, and in French we have V, but F in this form here. So I'm I'm assuming the V is environmental because of this r you know uh after it 
right? Or there's a vowel after it. So it may it may just really construct to F. But we would need more examples, which we'll see uh, a little later. And so you can see these examples here is uh, the uh, you can you can go through these each individually, you know, on your own. And so, again, it's a lot more clear in the documents that you have. So, uh, you know, so excuse this, you know, kind of digital kind of, you know, uh, blurry form that you see here. So let's let's go and see what uh, the <coughs> the author, you know, says here. So in table one, which is what we just are, we just saw. A set of romance cognates excluding the Latin. Remember, the Latin is just there for us to kind of measure against. But we're really comparing Italian, Portuguese, French, and Spanish, right? That we've discussed in the successive slides has been given. In general, it is convenient to begin with the cognates from basic vocabulary. So, you know, you want to try to avoid, unless you're just doing a study on culture words or religious words, you know, um, but to try to get vocabulary on basic uh, vocabulary to do the comparisons with. So when we talk about basic vocabulary, we're talking about vocabulary that no matter what human group, no matter where you are on earth, you you would have a word for this because it's, it's, it's common to every human experience. So for example, body parts, close kinship terms, everybody got a mama and daddy, and we may all have brothers and sisters and cousins and and the like, right? Um, and and children and great grandparents. So, so we have words for those. So low numbers, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, right? Uh, going to ten. Common geographical terms: word for sky, word for water, word for river, word for trees, word for ground, word for earth, word for soil, word for flowers, word for plants, etc. Because these lexical items are rarely borrowed. So, you know, usually when we come into contact with other people and we borrow words from them, we borrow words for certain technologies, you know, certain inventions, certain cultural phenomena, certain religious phenomena, etc. You know, we don't we don't need to borrow their word for sun because we have a word for sun. But just because a word is rarely borrowed in a basic vocabulary that does not mean that um, it is impossible to be borrowed. It is just less likely and compared to other words, which is why we 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 deal with so-called basic vocabulary. All right. So let's continue. And it is a good idea to compare the true cognates for the comparative method. These cognates, which are related in the daughter languages by virtue of being inherited from the proto language. For a better and successful reconstruction, we must eliminate all other sets of similar words, which are not due to inheritance from a common ancestor. This would be those words which exhibit similarities among the languages because of borrowing, chance similarity, and so on. Ultimately, it is the systematic correspondences which we discover in the comparative method in the following steps, which demonstrate true cognates. So let's 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 go back to our slide example before we get into the author's uh dr weiss's examples here right so let's let's go here so what do we mean so we can see that you know these are very basic words i'm not i'm not doing anything religious or whatnot so you know uh, all women have breasts or nipples or just uh, every human being has a chest you know everywhere you go there are rocks or stones so there's a word for stone or to flee or fear. This is an action that every human being, you know, deals with. So you notice that it's a pattern that we're seeing here. And so with what the process of the comparative method does is that it eliminates chance. And what do we mean by chance? We'll get into chance in a minute. But because you see these examples here, with these sound correspondences, we can create a formula. Proto-Bantu BD implies Middle Egyptian BN. 
And so this is what we call an implicational law. And so this, this comes directly out of logic. And when we talk about implied, so when you see um, this, this arrow here, now in, in most instances, you know, you can also say that this becomes, but this is not the case. We're not saying that Middle Egyptian derives from Proto-Bantu. So this means implies. So the BD consonant sequence in Proto-Bantu implies Middle Egyptian BN. So we can see the sound correspondences here, BD to BN. So what we do is we're, we're trying to make a prediction. So what do we predict for the Proto-Bantu BD shine? So notice that this word, proto-bantu reconstruction, bod, shine, or to shine, the verb, is not in this correspondence set. But if I have this word in proto-bantu, given the law that we have here, what form, and I'm asking y'all in the comment section. So y'all, you know, who are in the comment section, y'all tell me, I'm going to look, uh, I'm going to give it a, a, a few seconds because I know there's a time delay. Y'all put in the the comment section what what is the expectation that you would have for egyptian right so if i have proto band to bod to shine if there is a cognate in the egyptian language what form would it have so give me the consonants in sequence in the the chat and i'll just wait a second so boo do 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 we have any takers in the chat? Do 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 I see one, I see two. And you know, uh, I'm black, so we got to remix it. Yeah, I'm acting a fool out here. Um, so let me, let me look, let me look, let me look here. So I see we have, all righty. So everyone that said B N or the consonants B N in the, um, in the, in the chat, you are correct. So this is the, the word that you find in the uh the egyptian language is what bid to shine right so we can we can see that you know even though i have this in a mathematical form and you see this here this is in the same form or fashion that i have in the correspondence set uh the correspondence uh column right here on the right hand side right so so proto bantu bod corresponds to what been to shine uh, in Egyptian. And so we can see from these that these are regular. We have a, you know, a correspondence set and we can make predictions based upon this correspondence set and establishing the sound correspondence. So the sound rules, the relationship rules for Proto-Bantu and Middle Egyptian, right? And so we also have this this um, this this W in front of shine. So this is a grammatical morpheme. How can we prove that? Let's look at an actual language and not a reconstruction. So we have a different word here in Egyptian, wabin. It has the same form as our word to shine. And so this is a verb. And so we have another verb with the same form, wabin, meaning to rise in Egyptian. And what I'm arguing is that it corresponds with mubandu, 
in Chiluba Bantu. So we had a Proto Bantu and we have the daughter language, which is Chiluba, which is spoken in the Democratic Republic of Congo, right? Meaning to ascend, to mount, or to rise, right? And so notice that I have these in purple. So if I argue that Chiluba Mu corresponds to the Egyptian W, how many more examples do I need in order to, to start to make that argument? So I, I gave you a hint here. You notice that I started with three and then I went to four. And so we, we always want to make sure that we have at least three. So when we have at least three, this shows a pattern and we knock out coincidence. We knock out chance as a explanation for the correspondences that we see. So although I have one, you know, correspondence here, this does not, this is not enough. I always have to give more. So this is exactly what you see in in this table here. So right now, I'm, I'm only concerned with the grammatical prefixes in both Egyptian and Chiluba Bantu. So notice that where Egyptian has W, Chiluba has Mu. And I have in red, these, these are the roots that I have in red in both languages. And even though we're not focused on the root, trust me, I, I've done this. All of these sounds correspond regularly in the language. But right now we're, we're concerned with the prefix. So even in this form here, this is a noun in the second row. And so I have other noun examples as well for Mu. But, you know, because we have the previous one, Mu Mandu, in this verb form, compared to Waben to rise, and we have Wade to bear fruit, to ripen, to be ripe here in Muguka, Mu and Guka, I mean, and then Wagim to grind grain, and then we have Mukanda to pound. These, these are all, you know, correspondent. So we've seen that we're, the fact that we can go back and we have these basic vocabulary words, right? And we have a series of correspondences and then we also have grammatical correspondences between uh, Bantu and Egyptian. These two things and more, of course, combined eliminates chance. The only logical explanation that you have is that these two languages descended from the same ancestral language, right? So this is why we do the steps that we do, because we want to be systematic and we want to be scientific in our approach. And, and this is what this, this process does. So when you see me, you know, and I have this, I'm not just putting words up on a screen. Anybody could put words on the screen. I want y'all to understand when I'm putting these, these correspondences, these aren't words on the screen. These are correspondence sets. Right, these are cognate sets. And when I'm showing you the the sounds that correspond, this this is what we do to read to begin the process of reconstruction. All right. So I'm gonna come out of that and go back to our uh, original slide. So let's get busy, right? Okay, so in general, it is convenient to begin with cognates from basic vocabulary that we mentioned earlier. And it is a good idea, I'm skipping down now, to compare true cognates for the comparative method. These cognates, which are related in the daughter languages by virtue of being inherited from a proto-language. For a better and successful reconstruction, we must eliminate all other sets of similar words which are not due to inheritance from a common ancestor. Again, that's why I went back and showed you the series of sound correspondences, because that's the process that we use to eliminate chance as an explanation for the uh, apparent, um, uh, the apparent, you know, relationship between the terms, right? 
So these could be those words which exhibit similarities among the languages because of borrowing, chance similarity, and so on. Ultimately, it is the systematic correspondences which we discover in the comparative method in the following steps which demonstrate true cognates. Right? So now we the second step is to establish the sound correspondences. So we're, we're just, uh, I just have one or two more slides that I'm going to do. And then I'm going to end there. So the next we're going to pick up with the step three, reconstruct the proto sound. Right. But we're just going to do these these last three uh, slides and then we're going to be done for today. So step two, establish the sound correspondences. So we assembled the cognate sets. And now we are establishing the, the sound correspondences. So what he's going to do now is we're going to go back to that that uh, this this table here, this table one. So he's going off of table one here. And so now. Next, we attempt to determine the sound correspondences. For example, in the words for goat in cognate set one in the table one, the first sound in each language corresponds in the way as indicated in sound correspondence one. We must focus on the phonemic representation of the sound than the, the conventional spelling. So going back to the table. So this is the conventional spelling on the top row in row one, and then the phonemic explanation in and so we'll have to do a separate uh video you know going through the ipa and uh the phonemic sounds of languages right so we we we, we deal with these sounds you know we can use the the first one as well you just you would just have to explain you know to the reader you know what each one of these means they're all symbols you can you can substitute each one of these with a picture of a fruit it wouldn't matter because they're all just symbols. You never compare actual sounds. These symbols represent idealized realizations of sounds spoken by a speech community. And so you can, like I said, you can substitute these with numbers. You can substitute these with, uh, you know, pictures of fruit. All that matters is that you are consistent and that it's logical, you know, all the way, you know, through and that you see a pattern when you put them side by side uh, with each other. So let's go back. So we must focus on the phonemic representation of the sound, then the conventional spelling. Sound correspondence one. So in Italian, they have K in the first. Uh, remember that this, these are the sounds, not the actual spelling. So the they have the K sound in the first consonant position in Italian, in Spanish, and in Portuguese, but in French, they have the sh sound. And this is the symbol that we use for sh, right? Note that historical linguists often use the convention of a hyphen after a sound to indicate the initial position before a sound to indicate final and at both ends to show the middle sound. So let me, let me uh, come over here, I'm gonna go back to my correspondence set here. So you notice that in the correspondence, the sound correspondence column, how do I know that we're, we're in this row here, I'm comparing the first sounds of the, uh, you know, the cognate forms or the, the, the potential cognates between these two words. That's because I put a dash after it to let you know that this comes, this B comes before any of the other sounds. How do I know that the D that I'm comparing here is, is, is the last, I'm uh, comparing it with the N. You see now that the dash comes before, right? So you know that on this row, because of the direction of where the, or I should say the position of where the dash is placed, this lets me know that I'm dealing with the first consonant. And because the dash is placed before these two consonants, these let you know that these are the last consonant in, in the root for which we are comparing. So this is so you know this is a, a linguistic convention. So when you see this, this is why you see those dashes when I'm doing this work. All right. <laughs> so
Let's go back. All right. So it is important to attempt to avoid potential sound correspondence which are due to merely chance. For example, languages may have words which are similar only by accident, as the case of Kachakel, which is a Mayan language, the word mess, which means mess or disorder or garbage, or English mess, disorder, or untidiness. So what he's trying to say here is that in the Kachako language, there's a word mess, and it sounds just like the English word mess, and it actually has the same meaning or same or similar meaning. But, you know, is, is Kachako mess from the Mayan language cognate with the English mess? That's the question that we have to ask, right? So when we look at the two languages, you know, if they were cognate, the, if mess and mess were cognates between Kachiko and English, we would ex expect to see in the, in the first consonant position, the words starting with M in English also uh, finding, you know, a similar pattern in Kachiko. So if you look in the lower left-hand corner here, we, we have some words here in English, man, mouse, moon, mother, right? But let's look at the Kachiko. Achi, choi, or choi, kat it, nan. We can see here that there is no series of correspondences. So this is how we know that the word mess in English and the word mess in Kachiko are not cognates. It is just a coincidence that they sound similar and that they have similar meanings. And so we have to remember that that human language, excuse me, human uh, speech capacity is very limited, right? And as a result of the limited speech capacity and sound production capacity of Homo sapiens sapiens, given the thousands and thousands of languages around the world, you by just by statistical chance, you are going to find vocabulary words that sound the same and maybe even uh, have similar meanings in some far off remote languages. So this is why we do the comparative method so that we can eliminate chance. This is what puts us on a scientific ground, on a scientific and, and mathematical status, right? Because, you know, we, we're eliminating chance. And that's exactly what you would do in the scientific method. So the reason why you do the experiments the same way and in different ways you add new variables and you have that statistical mean and all this other kind of calculations is to eliminate chance. And so we do the same thing in historical comparative linguistics. And so the last slide. Uh, he goes on further to explain what, what, what we just stated here. Similarly, we need to attempt to eliminate similarities found in borrowed items, which seem to suggest sound correspondences. Usually, borrowed items do not exhibit the sort of systematic sound correspondences found in the comparison of native words among related languages. Meaning that if you if you are seeing these these systematic sound meaning correspondences in all areas of vocabulary and grammar, it is it is no longer a coincidence that these that we find in these correspondences. It can only logically be explained as a result of these two or more languages descending from a common ancestor. And so uh, this is why we do what we do again. However, it is a known fact that basic word lists or vocabulary does have much borrowed items, as I mentioned earlier. Anyway, so we uh, can't be safe if we take the basic word list. Or, so we can be safe if we take the basic word list for our examples. Um, given that sound correspondence one reoccurs frequently among the Romance languages as seen in the forms compared in table one, we assume that this sound correspondence is genuine. It is highly unlikely that a set of systematically corresponding sounds such as this one could come about by sheer accident. And it's the same thing when we do in our comparisons 
with uh, Egyptian, right? And so we do the same thing when we're coming, you know, this is just one of my examples on, on Kemet here, right? When we do, if I say that the that Chicongo, which is an actual place in Central Africa, is cognate with the word Kemet, I'm not I'm not saying this, you know, because I just want to and I've just got nothing else to do. I'm saying this because I can demonstrate systematic sound correspondences between Kikongo and ancient Egyptian on the same form of the words, where in the, the first consonant position in Kikongo is K, it's going to correspond or implies in Egyptian, which I call Chikam, K in the first consonant position. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six in this uh, correspondence set. So these are six observations. You know, in science, we talk about observations. These are six observations in this correspondence set in each language. And where Kikongo has ng, like in singing, like you have ng, in the second consonant position, this cluster corresponds to M in Egyptian in the second consonant position. You know, this is how we're, we're able to, to make these correspondences here. And, and, we, and you'll see in the upcoming book where like in this last row where I have here, these correspond. So key Congo K corresponds to dotted H in Egyptian. And then M interchanges with W and so does B in any position, you know, uh, first consonant or second position, right? Because it's because the this lets us know that there's a vowel behind here. And when the M or B is in between two vowels, it weakens and becomes W, right? And so this is just part of a set. So I have a, a more fuller set in the upcoming text and which you can see. So we, when we, you know, this is how we know Congo and Kemet are one and the same, right? And so we always eliminate the chance by doing these reoccurrent sound meaning correspondences. And this is part of the process of the comparative method. And so, as I stated, you know, the next time we're going to start with step three and reconstruct the proto sound and, and show you how we do that. And we're going to deal with directionality, how the majority wins, right? And factor in features held in common. You know, that's a, that's a whole, you know, different lesson. So I am going to stop right there and I'm going to check the comment section 155 comments and see if there are any questions uh, let's see i'm scrolling all the way up and you know we'll take a quick commercial break you see i have a lot of things a lot of things that's on my mind and i would like to let them out I see reality breaking down all my fantasies It would be nice if I at least had one fantasy The neutrality about to take a terabyte From the American apple pie better get a slice It's kinda scary the way that this life is moving on Marvin's doing backflips inside his grave, what's going on? We have head-on collisions, not seeing another's vision Maybe that's the reason why some colors fit the description A lot of relationships need life rafts, sinking ships I guess you just can't have only one like potato the chips. I would love for you to listen with an open heart, but would you really even hear me if it's torn apart? I don't do the things that I used to. I'll be fine even if I lose you. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Alrighty, we are back, and I don't see any questions. Just as usual, the trolls come in. And it's just a lot of slick talk, but we love you all too. And I'll put this for anybody that wants to support the channel. 
And let me go back into the comments and see what is going on. Let's see. Yurok Taraji. Oh, Taraji. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. So what makes those correspondents stronger than the Coptic? I don't know if there's, if, if there's even a a what should we say a competition between one stronger than the other well i, I can say that the that the bantu correspondences are stronger than the cop the coptic because the the coptic is a a language dialect coptic emerges as a result of foreigners in the delta adopting you know one of the dialects of egyptian and just like how you know when the when the hebrews came into canaan and adopted the canaanite language and how the germanic speakers came into what is now france the francs that's what they were called uh and adopted the latin language it created a whole new different language and so what happens with coptic is that it's not necessarily like if we're comparing Coptic with, you know, it would it'd just be a normal language that we would compare with other African languages. But it's it's unique in in Egyptian because, you know, you have aspects of it that is inherited, but you also have aspects of it that is the result of what we call diglossia, meaning that they they borrow from themselves, you know, from Egyptian texts and and they bring it forward into time so if if we was to i don't know how long you've been in the com in the in the chat or or if you was at the beginning of the conversation but there was a slide where i showed that the word sorrow that we say now in modern english was is a reflex of an earlier form called sore right we no longer say sore we say sorrow but if if i just decided to start a trend where i'm taking all the middle english words and bringing them forward and started using sorry you know like like you know kind of closer to the word sorry right um that would be an instance of diglossia and to eliminate that as an argument you know this is why you use you know languages that are further away which we which we could not say is the result of borrowing from the ancient egyptian language mm -hmm. and then in regards to the word kemet the word kemet itself in terms of kim words in the old kingdom and middle kingdom uh you know uh languages there were there are far more kim words in the language when you get to by the time you get to coptic there is only like two or three you know the the word for black and um i think the word for complete in its in its variants but all the other kim words no longer exist in coptic so when you want to do uh the comparative method in linguistics the oldest forms are always the best forms to compare this is why we deal with middle egyptian in in old kingdom uh forms when when comparing them to you know modern african languages it's always the oldest forms that are the most important and you know for for anyone that needs the quote unquote professionals i have the citation cited in the Lutra volume two for that fact so it's not it's not that we don't use Coptic. It's just that Coptic, the the forms, the comparative forms don't exist, uh, or barely exist in the Coptic language, and so much of the words and things have changed and eroded by that time. So again, the details are in the Middle Kingdom and Old Kingdom texts, and so it still has all the grammatical forms because of course the the suffix t has been dropped in coptic and um and coptic does not have the classifiers or the quote-unquote determinatives 
And so the determinatives are key to answering this question. And so the Egyptians gave, gave you the tools in order to decipher the text. You just got to go to the Middle and Old Kingdom uh, hieroglyphic script because Coptic is not going to tell you much of anything. So that's why. But no, it's, it's not an issue of better better than or, or, or stronger per se. But, you know, using distantly related languages uh, eliminates the idea that, you know, for example, that the Chiluba, if you don't believe that the Baluba people were in ancient Egypt, then any correspondences between them could not be the result of borrowing from the ancient Egyptians. It can only be the result of uh, the inheritance from the proto language. So, so everything is strategic in this manner, right? So let me go now. Um, um, let me see. <laughs> no, sir. I, I I don't work out. I don't I don't learn while I'm doing online. You know, uh, all this stuff I know for a fact. And have been doing it for years and have been teaching this for years and so this this is just for the new people who who entered this conversation and and have requested this because they didn't understand they didn't know where to go so that's why i gave out the sources and i'm, I'm not trying to bog y'all down with thick books just read that and you know hopefully you'll get the bug and let's see Oh, kind of skip now. And thanks to Sister Ladosha for uh, her contribution, you know, to the to the channel. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you uh, very much. And again, we will have Sister Ladosha this coming Thursday on the Mbongi. So make sure that you uh, tune in. And then on Tuesday before her is going to be our good brother Vince Robinson. And before him. We starting off the uh, All Star Week, the Cleveland All Star Week, with uh, our good brother Kevin MC Chill Heard, and we're going to have one more other person. We're just trying to iron out the time, and so I'm trying to see if I can get him in on Tuesday, along with Brother Vince, at a different time. But we'll see. All right. So yeah, let me go back to the chat, and let me see. Yeah, y'all just want some other stuff in here. Uh, let's see. Do 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 do. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't do that live. Um, that's. That's why I took classes. I, I paid for them and did my assignments and turned them in and got grades for them on this stuff. And I, and I during uh, what you call it, internships and apprenticeships of the other linguists over the years. So this is this is how uh, this is how we do it. And. Geez. Sister Dawson said, sorry, be making me want to go back to school. <laughs> I appreciate it. And uh, Jehuti asked, sorry, has anyone challenged Mboli's work in writing yet? Nope, not to my knowledge. And of course, it's written in French, so you know, it, it more than likely s someone who's a native French speaker and writer would more than likely respond to him. Uh, but to my knowledge, I have not, uh, I have not seen any uh, rebuttals or arguments, you know, against his work. <laughs> yeah, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call him remedial, but they're they're. They they have a long way to go. That that's that's a fact. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, 
He said, we, we, pause. I don't know what y'all talking about. So it doesn't look like there are any particular questions. Oh, yeah, that, that doesn't even count. Clyde Winters didn't even read the book and had did a whole video and blog post on a book he didn't read and he couldn't read because, you know, it, and, and this was evident because what he did, like you can, there's a preview that you can see of Emboli's book if you do like a Google book search. And what he did is he skipped through to some pages all the way in the middle and then, res, then did a response over it and got the whole thing wrong. And, and this is a key indicator he can't read French. There's nothing that he said on that page was ever discussed on the pages in which he made an argument for. This is how, you know, this is one of the many reasons why I can't take Clyde Winter seriously. Um, and let's see. Let me see. Nope, nope, nope. All righty. Well, since there are no, you know, questions, this ends part one of our series and uh, probably do part two on Sunday, you know, if I have some time. So I do appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, let me see. Marcel Taylor says, has there been any breakthroughs regarding deciphering erotic? Not to my knowledge. I, I've heard that there was one person um, who discovered something new, but no, no real breakthroughs throughs just yet. And, you know, so we're still waiting. I put my hat in the ring in, in that process. So, you know, we'll see how it uh, all unfolds in the near future. But, uh, so I'm going to have to catch the replay from the beginning, indeed. So with that said, I hope that y'all enjoy y'all weekend and, you know, continue to support the channel. Make sure that you, you know, join the Patreon and that you visit the China into film.com. And also, don't forget Osiri University org. And so we had uh, the, the founder and, and one of the teachers on recently. And so, you know, this is this is a very big project that uh, we definitely want you all to support. And so if any of y'all is having an after party or something like that, you know, maybe I'll join in tonight uh, or listen in at least. So with that said, y'all be easy. Enjoy your weekend. Be safe and love on and hug on your family members. Right. Make sure you spend that quality time with family. And with that said, I am out. Peace.